But I have a, a strong genetic predisposition. Okay. Because my father, my grandma, my uncle, my brother, all diabetic. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So yeah, it means I mean I have a strong genetic predisposition. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to season four of the Rhinoplasty podcast. I can't believe we're into our fourth year of doing Rhinoplasty podcast. I'm so excited for the season. It's really going to be a great year, 2024 for us. And kicking off the season is a man who has had such an influence around the world of Rhinoplasty, all the way from South Korea, and is part of our faculty for the World Rhinoplasty Day later on this year. It's, it's really great to have him back on the show after a few years. Yongju Jang, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, for having me again. So I really enjoyed my previous uh, talk with you about rhinoplasty. So today I'm ready for any, anything you want to hear from me. Awesome. <laughs> so, so, so let's just kick it off for the listeners. Tell them a little bit about who you are and where you live and you know, how, how, what do you get up to every day? Okay. Um, my name is Yongju Chang. My last name is Zhang, but my, my many European colleagues call me Yang, but it's Zhang. Uh, I'm uh, working as pro uh, professor and department chair of the Assam Medical Center. This is the biggest tertiary medical center in my country. And uh, I've been uh, practicing in Assam Medical Center more than 20 years. So um, my work is mostly focused on the nodal surgery, mm -hmm. rhinoplasty, septal functional surgery, and the surgery for the empty nodal syndrome and surgery for the uh, radiatory hemorrhagic telangiectasia, those kind of things. Yeah. I, I'm, um, I also are uh, uh, doing many, many researches and especially in rhinoplasty and some basic science of rhinology. So I love teaching, I love seeing the patients and uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So there, there are two topics we want to talk to you about today. Mm -hmm. um, off air we were discussing, we had breakfast and I was like amazed when I saw there was like no carbohydrates in your breakfast. So that's the one topic we, we want to discuss. And then after that, let's chat a little bit more about the empty nose syndrome. But explain to me, we, we, you were talking to me about inflammation and how you have to look after your own health, etc., and how your food has such a big influence on your overall health. So, so tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, it's um, based on my personal history on my health. Um, from 2003, uh, it was at the age of my 40. Uh, my hospital uh, provided me a regular health checkup every year. Yes. So I did my health checkup every year. It includes glucose and HbA1c and all the other stuffs and um, and ribosona too. And from the 2003, I got a report that I have a little bit of elevated uh, glucose level. It's over over 100. And I was diagnosed with a little bit of uh, mild fatty acid. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I, I was not that fat. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of a thin guy. Yeah. Uh, I just neglected it. I overlooked it. But um, after uh, 2003, in every regular checkup, I have uh, elevated blood glucose level, fasting level, and uh, mild fat level. The other problem is that I have, um, sometimes I have um, very uh, severe glucose spike mm -hmm. and hypoglycemic event, mm -hmm. which made me very, very difficult in physically and mentally. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't consider it uh, seriously. Yeah. I just overlooked it because they say that you are pre-diabetes, you are not diabetes yet, but you have to be careful be because yeah. you can become diabetes in some day. Yeah. So that's what I heard. But um, in 2012, uh, one of my friend who is uh, as thin as me, uh, shockingly have a, a coronary uh, artery stent because of the uh, coronary artery stenosis. Yeah, yeah. So it shocked me. So I decided to uh, take the uh, coronary artery CT scan. Okay. I, so, I found that uh, the report says that uh, I have two uh, stenosis in coronary artery. Wow. It was moderate degree stenosis, more, more than moderate, moderate degree. So, I was really shocked. So, I look back my data and what uh, 
what caused this problem? Because I don't smoke. Yeah. My blood pressure is very good. I'm not obese. So I was really um, curious and shocking, and I uh, reviewed my all of my uh, uh, lab data, uh, which was done every year. And what I noticed was that I have consistently uh, elevated uh, fasting blood blood glucose level, and I have a mild fat level all the time. And the one other thing is, um, from 2007, uh, my hospital included fasting insulin level in my checkup. And I noticed that there was a sharp increase in the insulin level from 2008. Yeah, it was uh, beyond uh, normal range, quite, quite high. So, and I studied myself, I researched myself. So I came to realize that my coronary artery problem, stenosis, was due to pre-diabetes yeah. and insulin resistance. Okay. So the elevated insulin level means that you, your uh, pancreas pump out insulin, but because it does not work properly in the peripheral tissue, it's, it's pump more and more, and then uh, your uh, body became more and more insulin resistant. And then, you know what, the insulin is an uh, anabolic hormone when you have elevated insulin level, mm -hmm. you, you will have fat liver. You will have uh, abdominal fat, yes. belly fat. Yes. And there are several other um, health issues related with the insulin, elevated insulin level. So there are firm scientific evidence. Nowadays, um, insulin resistance is considered as an important uh, pathogenic mechanism for the, the cardiac disease, just like uh, coronary stenosis, uh, type 2 diabetes. And for the woman, uh, it causes polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is, is a good, a very important uh, underlying cause of the in female infertility. And on top of that, I have terrible migraine. I, suffer, I have suffered migraine headache. Okay. And so, uh, I, I could uh, link to that, and I'd see all of my heart problem was related with my uh, insulin uh, resistance and insensitivity to insulin. So, uh, one question, though. In terms of your lipogram, mm -hmm. was that abnormal at all? Because in South Africa, it's a mm -hmm. very common to have hyperlipidemia. And I'm on statins, yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah. Let me tell you. Before uh, I took the coronary CT scan, I, I followed up my uh, lipid profile every year, completely normal. Wow. Yeah. So I uh, made a. I want to make a big challenge. So I actually I am not a believer of the cholesterol hypothesis of the uh, coronary yeah. artery disease. Right. Yeah, yeah. There are there are some yeah. guys yeah. who uh, insist on that, but. Yeah. Be, Based on my own uh, personal health journey, I, at least in my case, the, yeah, lipid, yeah, lipid was completely normal. Wow. Yeah, so it, okay. low pressure is normal, as I mentioned before. So for me, lipid was not an issue anymore, yeah. zero issue. But so I realized that uh, for me, the main problem was the insulin resistance because I have a, a strong genetic predisposition. Okay. Because my father, my grandma, my uncle, my brother, all diabetic. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So yeah, it means I mean I have a strong genetic predisposition. Okay. And the other uh, reasons for the, the increasing the risk of insulin resistance is stress. Yes and inflammation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Those are three important uh, things. So, as you know, doctors have... Uh, so those are the things you have to address to yeah. decrease your... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Stress yeah. and inflammation. Because I uh, suffered, uh, from time to time, I suffered Hashimoto thyroiditis. I had um, um, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. I think those kind of things yeah. predisposed to the formation of my coronary artery uh, wow. stenosis. So, the, what happened was after knowing uh, that, what I did first was I just quit all the sweet things, okay. all the refined food. I mean, um, if 
if it tastes sweet, I just didn't take it. Because before uh, knowing that, I drink Coke quite often. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, 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 and I, I enjoy the fruit, sweet fruit. I enjoy sometimes snacking with uh, cookie and rice bread and things like that. But I completely quit it. And then the next, the very next year, yeah. I had a checkup again. Yeah. My blood glucose, uh, fasting blood glucose level went down okay. to the normal range. Okay. My fatty liver is gone. Yeah. My HB A1C is quite normal. My, at the uh, surprising, my insulin level became no, quite normal. That's amazing. Yeah, and then, yeah, that. And how of, did you deal with the stress part of things? Mm -hmm. What about the stress part of things? Uh, but it's difficult to control. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that was right. So, yeah. yeah so, for the stress control, I just uh, to be more mindful about yeah. what uh, my daily life. Yeah, I, yeah. I uh, try to uh, let me just flow of life. So don't uh, strive too much. So, yeah. But I think the main uh, issue for me was the increased uh, the improved health was because of changing my diet so what i did was i just cut coke i cut a juice i cut i didn't take any more um, uh, sugary things and then uh, other than that improved blood profile i lost eight kg eight eight kilogram in one year whoa but you're looking it's the healthiest yeah, i've yeah, seen you yeah, yeah, but yeah. you were never an overweight obese kind of person i was not overweight at that time yeah wow. yeah and then uh, one other thing is when I, when I, I think uh, one thing I added more is after each meal, I uh, climb up the stairs about 20 Brilliant. or 10. Brilliant. It, because the exercise after the meal can increase your insulin sensitivity. It, it really increases your insulin, insulin sensitivity. After a meal, exercise after a meal, yeah, not after before. A meal. Yeah, not That's before. interesting. Yeah. After yeah, because for because, listeners... because let me tell you, yeah. if you have something, especially carbohydrate diet, your glucose level goes up, mm -hmm. then insulin follows up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do exercise, uh, insulin, your insulin sensitivity in the muscle is increased. Mm -hmm. So you can on the better control of the, your blood glucose level. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I, it's proven fact that uh, you better, if you have a problem in the, in the glucose level control, you better do exercise after the meal, not before the meal. That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for those other listeners, we were actually going to be coming. I was going to say, should we go up on the lift? And you know, she said, <laughs> no, no, I'm taking the stairs. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah, after, after the meal. Yeah. Wow. So the, uh, the, that's the one, one enlightenment I had. So, um, so I started, uh, I quit the sweet things and I started kind of low carb diet, low yeah. carbohydrate. Yeah. So I reduced my, the portion size of my rice. I tried to uh, keep distance from the um, uh, bread. Yeah. And it was good. But um, so uh, my metabolic health was quite good. But last year, for some reason, my migraine got aggravated very very badly i had um, once or twice a week i have a migraine attack with visual scotoma it it really really uh, limited my everyday work in the middle of surgery i have to leave and take a take a rest to because i cannot see because oh. when, when i have migraine i have visual scotoma okay and the headache is killing me so I was under uh, many, many different uh, preventive medication uh, known to be effective for the prevention, but it does, didn't work. So I, t I took many, many anti-epileptic drugs and uh, many drugs. So you know, out of desperation, uh, starting this year, I, uh, I came to realize that uh, ketogenic diet has been a uh, standard uh, well evidence uh, proven treatment option for the epilepsy especially the childhood epilepsy so i i uh, decided to adopt that idea to to control my migraine headaches so i became even more stricter so uh, uh, until last year i i took uh, 
this amount of carbohydrate, but this year I reduced it further. Wow. I reduced it further. And um, surprisingly, it worked. Yeah. It worked for me. So uh, this year I just have had uh, so far just three attacks. It was a uh, much more milder degree. So uh, my quality of life is really, really uh, improved a lot. So after that, I became more, uh, more uh, interested in the uh, dietary aspect of the health. So I studied a lot of the ketogenic diet. It has firm enough science, scientific evidence that uh, that kind of the uh, ketogenic diet, diet is quite helpful for the brain health. Mm -hmm and cardiac health and uh, many uh, other areas of the, uh, not to mention about the liver. Yeah, yeah. And um, there is an interesting uh, uh, notion that uh, Alzheimer's disease is a type 3 diabetes. Have you heard about it? Yes, I've, I've heard, yeah, but yeah. I haven't really gone yeah, yeah. researched into it. So it means that uh, the patient who has some problem in the glucose to intolerance and glu uh, glucose uh, blood glucose level regulation and insulin resistance has about three times a higher chance of having Alzheimer's. Uh, and there are many interesting studies about the uh, benefit, health benefit of the low carb or ketogenic diet. Low carb diet and ketogenic diet is not the same, but it's, it's a similar. Um, so there are some uh, psychiatrists in US who, who has real um, surprisingly good uh, treatment outcome after trying um, let them have a ketogenic diet and their depression and bipolar disorders and schizophrenia is went away. Yeah, there are many surprising anecdotal uh, yes. data, uh, data yeah. scientific evidence. So, so um, yeah, the, the only problem is I lost a little more weight after yeah. having, uh, yeah, re restricting the carbohydrate. And exercise wise? Exercise, I, I enjoy exercise. Uh, I always do, um, as I told you, I uh, enjoy climbing upstairs. Yeah. And after returning to home uh, uh, in the night, uh, we have a very beautiful river nearby my house. So I walk uh, nearby the, uh, on the um, river about one hour every day with my wife. Right. And it's your wife who's going to come uh to Africa in a couple of yeah, months' time, yes, eh? Yes, Here's so our, yes, to show you a real rhinoceros, <laughs> eh? So excited, yes. Yeah, so, so Yongju, two little other things. I mean, we're packing it in in season four now. Talk to me a little bit about World Rhinoplasty Day. So uh, you're, you're the representative for that whole zone of the world. There's six different representatives coming in. And uh, I mean, it's, it's exciting to be able to have so many speakers from 48 countries to compete. I respect your idea of getting together all the rhinoplasty researchers in the world because um, perspectives on rhinoplasty is different between continent to country. Absolutely. Yeah. Europe, Africa, Asia has different goals and different uh, techniques uh, which we prefer to use. So yeah. it's um, Thanks to your effort, we had already won uh, inter uh, internet-based uh, World Rhino Plus Days. It was a huge surprise uh, and huge success. And yeah. I think the second one should be even more great uh, because uh, we can uh, share our unique aspect of Rhino Plus and we can share the knowledge and uh, unique techniques uh, which is uh, preferred in a certain region of this uh, world. So um, I'm, I'm very proud of the, uh, to be selected as uh, the uh, uh, representative of the Asian. So um, yeah, I'll try my best to bring uh, as many Asian as yeah, colleagues. Really yeah. So guys, one, one, I, I promised at the start we're going to speak about empty nose syndrome mm -hmm. as well. Youngju, can you give us a, like for the listeners out there, just a very brief five minute summary. I mean, this is, we can speak for hours about it and oh, I sure. love speaking to you on the sure, podcast, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but maybe you can give, give, because it is something that's not spoken about enough within the world of rhinoplasty yeah, yeah, and rhinology, yeah, yeah. but share some of your pearls of wisdom with us, please. Okay. The empty nose syndrome is basically a iatrogenic condition. So we coined that term when the patient suffer 
symptoms like nasal obstruction, very, very dry nose, and painful nasal breathing, and airflow hitting the nasal pharynx and trachea, mm -hmm. and they suffer insomnia, sometimes uh, nosemia. Uh, the prerequisite is that they should have uh, some kind of, of nose surgery. It was believed to uh, occur mostly after the aggressive turbinate volume reduction. That includes turbinectomy and turbinoplasty, and even uh, radio frequency volume reduction can cause amputation syndrome. But uh, I, I found some patients who have um, a very severe spur in the septum. Mm -hmm. I removed, I just corrected it. But then he start to have the symptoms of amputation syndrome. So. The other uh, unusual cases, uh, who the patient who underwent quite aggressive uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, mm -hmm. whose middle uh, meatus is completely open, mm -hmm. uh, they also can suffer the symptoms like um, suggestive empnodes syndrome, characterized by yeah. paradoxical nasal obstruction, uh, unable to sense the flow of the uh, nasal flow, mm -hmm. dry nose painful nasal breathing. So uh, for, for that kind of patient, each and every res nasal respiration is agony. Yes. Yeah, it's agonizing yeah, yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. So they, they become so miserable. So they usually, they um, suffer insomnia, depression. We don't know clearly what predisposes first, but the thing is, we, what we have to respect is that there are certain subset of patients who suffer uh, the uh, unexpected consequence of the improved nasal airway after any kind of nasal surgery. Mm -hmm. So we have to be mindful. So, so uh, as I told you, the most common reason for the empty nose syndrome is inferior turbinate volume reduction. So I'm very, very careful. Uh, to man manipulate inferior terminate. So, mm. um, in 2018, I, so, uh, uh, in my personal history, I found empty nose syndrome for the first time in my country. So I reported, uh, I tried, started teaching yeah. the empty nose syndrome to my Korean colleagues. So yeah. I s published my first paper uh, in laryngoscope in back in 2009 or something. After that, I published about five papers. And I um, started uh, help the patient by implanting the coastal cartilage on the, in the inferior meatus area. After elevating the mucosa flap through the piriform aperture margin, I can augment uh, the missing inferior turbinate part with, I started with ear cartilage first. But then later I found that uh, ear cartilage is not enough in volume. So I started using coastal cartilage because I'm pretty, uh, I feel pretty easy for uh, handling coastal cartilage because I use coastal cartilage quite often in mm -hmm. random plus cases. So, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I found that it works, not 100%. So I would say that uh, about 60 to 70% of patients uh, got um, significant benefit yeah. by the surgical intervention. There are some other uh, methods. I also try to inject some stem cell, yeah. adipose uh, derived stem cell. It was very difficult clinical study because as you know, the clinical study is very difficult to design and difficult to have yeah. funding. Yeah. So um, I, I include, include recruited by 11 patients Three of them were showed effect. Uh, just one single injection of the stem cell. Mm -hmm. But my conclusion was not that uh, it, it, it's not so promising uh, because mm -hmm. there are many difficult hurdles we have to overcome to get stem cell from the patients. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so the other way I'm trying to help those uh, and in 2018, in European Vinyl Society meeting, I got invitation lecture of, of, about the Ampton Do syndrome. So it's on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. It had um, the highest number of views. 
among many Abstinence wow. Syndrome uh, lectures. We'll, we'll put so, the link on, on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Podcast. So after that, I have uh, many, many emails from the, all over the world. Last week, I operated a patient from Romania. Wow. Yeah. I got email from the patient from uh, US, Australia, France, uh, Russia. So it's, it's a big problem. And so, uh, and I, I, so far I operate to, uh, close to 200 patient, Korean patients. Sure. Uh, because uh, whenever uh, the amputation syndrome is suspected, all those, all those surgeons pay, uh, send the patient to me because I started treating them and I started teaching them. So, um, yeah, they are very difficult patients because most patients are quite depressive, quite uh, mm -hmm. anxious. It's, it's just like a psychiatric clinic. So um, I should have many more treatment options. So nowadays I'm trying to uh, prescribe them um, uh, ointment, which has nitroglycerin component. So the, my intention was induce the congestion of nasal mucosa. Yeah, it works in some, some patients, not, not all. Yes. And the other option I have is I designed the um, nasal plug, yeah. which was hang outside on the ala, and then inside it has a ball-like structure, yeah. which can compensate the missing turbinate tissue. Wow. Yeah, it's working great. So I was surprised. It, wow. So I thought about how can I help them? So I uh, have a rough design and, and I worked with a professor in uh, our university design uh, department and then we created, created, created a um, plug, uh, customized plug, uh, which was uh, based on the anatomical uh, missing portion of the individual CD scan. So uh, we collected uh, data about 30 uh, patients. I, uh, so far, I tried uh, that plug over 30 patients and we collected about 20 uh, patients and uh, now we, we are preparing the paper. So we'll uh, submit it to uh, some uh, rhinology journal. So for me, uh, yeah, rhinoplasty is um, my main job, but uh, I have a number of patients coming with that uh, clinical issues uh, like empty syndrome. So, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm trying, um, I'm striving to find a good therapeutic option and to help them to uh, live a better life uh, with, without uh, symptoms related with uh, amputation syndrome. It, it's really miserable. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Wow, man. It's <laughs> so amazing to listen to your story and, yeah. and, and thank you for your time. Thank yeah, you for yeah, you are, man, and I'm looking forward to um, seeing you again in a few months' time in Africa. Sure, yeah. so excited. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate it. To the listeners, guys, may this be a little taste of what's coming in season four. It's really we're digging for gold, eh, in this season. We want to get those nuggets that can help us change our lives and change our patients' lives. So thanks for listening, and see you again next week. Awesome. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.